I'm Jeff Glor, co-host of CBS This Morning Saturday. We are revisiting some of our stories that have brought us hope and inspiration from across the world. We begin in Boston, Massachusetts, where city and community leaders are engaged in a bold experiment to use higher education to transform its dangerous neighborhoods. Boston on Cornered recruits the city's youth involved in gangs, even paying them $400 a week to drop their guns and enroll in college. Dana Jacobson tells us more. 33-year-old Antonio Franklin is studying sociology at Boston's Bunker Hill Community College. How hard has school been for you the last couple of years? Extremely hard. Yeah. Juggling school with my family. <laughs> it's very hard, but when you value something, if you want it that bad, you're going to push yourself yeah. to, get, to get to what you want. Bunker Hill is only seven miles, but a world away from the Dorchester neighborhood where Franklin grew up. He's there on a scholarship of sorts, part of a program that gives former gang members money to stay in school. Some people may look at this and they'll say, this was a guy, he, he was in a gang. Why should we reward him by paying him to go to school now? I would say that, you know, we're not being paid really to go to school. I appreciate the money. It keeps us from detouring off our path. It gives us a little bit of help. Getting in this program, it gave me a second chance. It gave me another opportunity to live my life. Franklin started getting involved with gangs around the age of 13. What were some of the things that you got involved in? Well, you know, I got involved with, you know, selling drugs. I got involved with street stuff. I got fights. I've been stabbed, shot three times. You know, I've been through a lot. The game caught up with him in 2007. A cop was shot. You know, it was my actions that caused the reaction. He was shot by his own partner, and I ended up getting nine to ten years for it. But Franklin's life would change at his sentencing, thanks to what that wounded officer said. He wanted me to go in there, and he wanted me to change for the better, betterment of myself. And to hear that coming from a police officer, especially a police officer that was a victim of my actions, it really was a change of heart. He'd served 10 years. Before his release, he got his GED. Did you know what would await you when you got out? No. <laughs> That's the most scariest thing. A friend put Franklin in touch with Francisco Detina. This is my brother, so we help each other out. Detina is a college readiness advisor. Like Franklin, he's also a former gang member from Dorchester. My ninth grade teacher told me, he said, by the time you're 18, you're either going to be dead or in jail. Uh, I kind of, at that time, I kind of believed it. Uh, I thought that was my path. Uh, Did he say that to you as a warning or out of not believing? Not believing. You? Not believing in me. I just brushed it off and said, oh, whatever. Uh, but then when, you know, school wasn't for me no more and I was hanging out on the street, I was stuck in that corner. One day, a recruiter reached out from the local nonprofit College Bound Dorchester and asked Tatina to take some classes. What did you uh, think when he said that to you? Oh, uh, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do no classes. I've been through it. Um, school is not for me. And he didn't give up on me. And uh, eventually I said, you know what, I'll try it. College Bound Dorchester helped Tatina get his GED. He's paying them back All right. by helping to recruit others into the program. I always say um, it doesn't work the first time. It might not work the second. It might not even work the third time. Uh, the key to being a recruiter and doing this work is not giving up. Always go back. Try again. Why don't you give up? Because someone uh, didn't give up on me. So I'm not going to give up. How are you? Detina is now one of 15 recruiters who college-bound founder Mark Culleton considers core influencers for the organization's three-year-old program, Boston Uncornered. The strange thing is that I believe it's gang leaders and only gang leaders that can actually transform communities. Why is that? They're so disproportionately powerful, but that power can be harnessed for good. I think the one unconventional thing that people find is you're going to pay someone who's in a gang, been in a gang, to go to school. Right. It would be great if everybody could do exactly the right thing all the time. Uh, none of us do that. When you offer them a different opportunity and you say, we will invest in you to make different choices, they're desperate to do that. They want a way out. They just need an excuse and an opportunity. Culleton can relate. Having made poor choices as a teenager, after his parents' divorce. I immediately sort of fell off the cliff, started selling drugs, breaking into houses, like just sort of went wild. Yeah. Um, and I would get arrested 
and my college educated white mother would come down to the police station and like make the police apologize to me and send me home. He says the philosophy behind the program Boston Uncornered is based on three core principles. Hire former gang members. There's different scholarships out there. We're going to try to um, get you. Insist on high expectations from students and invest in their future. In other words, don't be afraid to put your money where your mouth is, to give these leaders an opportunity to make positive choices. And if you just do those three simple things, your city will change. What did you think when you first heard about it? I said it's about time. Boston Police Commissioner William Gross, the first African American to lead his force, sees this as an extension of the department's community policing enacted citywide. We want to reach the individuals that are having challenges and then help them out. So are you actually paying a gang member or are you paying, paying a future, right? So you think gangs, right? We pay for the lawyers, incarceration, the upkeep. No, this is an investment into someone's future to change their life for the better. And that will be a return investment for us, the community. Like Antonio Franklin, using the investment made in him to lay a foundation for his future and his family's. You have a two-year-old. Yes. What does this program mean in terms of, of him and the example you're able to set for him? A yeah, role model. Like, I'm, it, it shows that, you know, I don't w want my son to look back at my life or Google me and see that, oh, my father was just somebody who was in the streets. I want him to see that. My father, you know, he was in the streets, but he came home and he really did good and not just do good, he did good for the betterment of everybody around him. That's who I want to be. After the break, we take you to one of the world's largest refugee camps in Jordan. See how some are finding ways to heal from the trauma of being displaced. More than 10 million people have been displaced by the Syrian civil war that's been ongoing for nine years. As a result, millions have experienced psychological trauma. But Michelle Miller was able to witness a special program in Jordan meant to address a crisis in care for these invisible wounds. This is Market Street here, and it's a rustling, bustling urban center, so to speak. Absolutely. You can get pretty much anything you need that you would find in Amman or other cities nearby. But this isn't your average city in the Middle East. It's a center of commerce in one of the world's largest refugee camps, the Zatri camp in Jordan, home to nearly 80,000 Syrians displaced by civil war. None of us should ever be okay with calling this normal, but it's become an accepted reality for a lot of people. Mike Nickenshuk has been doing humanitarian work here since 2012. This started as a small collection of tents, but has turned into something more permanent. I saw that journey of what started out as shock of adjusting to this place, of leaving home, of losing friends, losing family, losing the very sense of identity that was once sacred. That loss would be difficult for anyone, but perhaps hardest for those with invisible wounds. Nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, barrel bombs, we've innovated in ways to stress people out, to traumatize people. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, we have to innovate by understanding science and how we can hack those systems that we already have to heal. Nick and Chuck isn't just an aid worker. He's also a brain scientist. Right, thank you everyone for coming. He works for Beyond Conflict, a nonprofit that combines behavioral science and humanitarian work. To do that here, Nick and Chuck created a self-help tool called the Field Guide for Barefoot Psychologists. Through this story about two displaced Syrian siblings, the guide simplifies brain science and teaches readers coping skills to recover from trauma. So there are emotional, mental processes that have a physical impact on your body. Absolutely. That can be addressed. Absolutely. Through simple exercises. Something very simple, using your breath, putting pressure to certain points and joints in your body, activates different aspects of the nervous system, of the endocrine system, whatever it might be. We believe knowledge is power. Let's give knowledge. It's not that hard. Kafa Awijan is a Syrian refugee living here. She leads field guide sessions to teach mindfulness and to show others that anger and depression are natural responses to the horrors they've experienced. 
I feel more relaxed, but I don't feel as though I've been through the trauma or stress that you have. Of course, yes, of course. The body will imply to the brain that I can relax. I can deal with the situation. I'm okay. And we will be able to relax. And at the same time, we will be effective. These classes have made all the difference for Yasmin al Nasan, a mother of four. Where did you feel the anxiety? Where was it? Identify it. Here. Shuts your throat down. Mm. Nightmares about the war made her seek out a psychiatrist at Zaitri. She would give me a medication, like sleeping pills or a sedative. I felt like it was local anesthesia. But what after the local anesthesia? I go back to feeling the same way. Al-Nasan says what she's learned has driven much of her anxiety away, allowing her to focus on what really matters. What I want for myself is to be a good mother, to find my way. What I want for my children is to realize the dreams I had for myself. There's mental health here available to people. How is your program different? Anyone is willing to read a story. By using story, we're functionally doing group therapy where you're allowing people who are living in a culture of incredible stigma against mental health an effective out where you're still talking about things by letting people talk about characters in a story where they're seeing themselves. Perhaps the field guide's stories hit home because they were co-authored by someone who lived them, Mohammed Kier Mustafa. What can you tell me about how you came here? Uh, Kabus. It was a nightmare. First, just going from village to village. Then, when things got even worse and the situation became more difficult, there were no options. So we had to come here. Mustafa put his suffering on the page to improve the lives of his fellow refugees. If a person understood his surroundings, his body, his needs, if he understood his responses to circumstances and traumas, then he will definitely be able to react properly. That certainly what Abdallah Kasawani hopes for. He defected from the Syrian government and now lives in this sea of shipping containers. But he dreams of raising his sons in a place with more opportunities. The guide came to help to open up a person's eyes to help him find the treasure that lies within him. The guide was able to communicate with a person's soul. This is how the guide was really able to help. The field guide is currently the subject of one of the largest studies to measure well-being in a post-conflict zone. And the findings are promising. There's some people who, because of the nature of their PTSD, they're hyper. They can't control their impulses. For other people, the response to loss, to trauma, has been to chill out, to mellow out too much. Every individual, no matter their symptom profile, seems to be getting what they need. If this works here, where else can it work? I want to see this with young incarcerated men in the United States. I want to see neo-Nazis dealing with their own stress and trauma. I want to see migrants coming across the border dealing with this. No one is guaranteed a life free from trauma. These are universal experiences. These are human experiences that can and will affect people at all levels of society. And I want to see this in as many places as possible across the United States. Coming up, we visit the Innovation Cathedral, where a 100-year-old church in New Jersey is now home to the world's largest producer and seller of audiobooks. We'll be right back. Newark, New Jersey has seen its share of hard times. But things are looking up in the brick city thanks to innovative public-private partnerships, like the one formed between the city and the audiobook company Audible. Michelle Miller saw how it's helping transform the lives of the city's residents. How did you find this place? This is just one of the great buildings in Newark that we've just embraced. You might think the, the world's movie. largest producer and seller of audiobooks would be in Seattle or Silicon Valley. It's the right thing to do, and I have a lot of reasons why. And besides, but Audible founder Don Katz just expanded his company into the soul of downtown Newark. Are these new? No, they were original. They were original? They were from 1932, so the church burned down. Audible's new home is this once abandoned 100-year-old church that's gone from house of worship 
to workspace. This was the original choir loft where people gathered to brainstorm and create ideas. It's called the Innovation Cathedral. So what are people doing here? So they're building various technologically oriented products. These are mostly software development engineers. In fact, Audible has become Newark's fastest growing private employer. With a workforce of more than 1,600 in the city, all engineering a new frontier of entertainment. Audible didn't just leave reading alone. If you think about it, there are millions and millions and millions of people listening to Audible now because we looked at the concept of reading and then thought about refracting it through this artful performances by actors. Flan, flan, ataquen a los blanquitos. But it's not just tech being developed here. It's young minds, too, as a partner in the city's education system. Audible donated more than $4 million over the past year by giving Newark Public High School students an Amazon tablet, headphones, and an Audible subscription. I was a book nerd. Book nerd. Oh, definitely. I read a lot of books. <laughs> it also offered students like Nicole Ransom internships. And a paycheck. Oh, yeah, we get paid. I started out with $14 an hour. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's a lot. A pretty good <laughs> investment of my time. CEO Don Katz got his start as a journalist, but developed into a true tech innovator. He's credited with creating the first digital audio player back in 1997, four years before Apple came out with the iPod. I was supposed to do a book about, you know, the digital media revolution like 25 years ago. And instead of writing the book, I saw that people would be running around with little digital devices filled with civilization. They'd be in your pocket. One thing came after another, and uh, I decided to create a company instead of write about it. Audible grew so fast that by 2008, Amazon paid a reported $300 million to buy it. How much did Amazon change the equation. The beautiful thing is that we have an incredibly independent culture, brand, and business model. They very much support what we're doing in Newark. Do they uh, you know, necessarily agree with everything we're doing? I don't really know. All I know is that we've had an amazing run here. The company moved from neighboring Elizabeth, New Jersey, to Newark in 2007, just as new blood swept into City Hall. Clear to me that they've been a good part of, partner. They have great intentions in doing what they can do. Mayor Ross Baraka is the latest reformer pushing big ideas, including a goal of having Newark-based corporations like Audible, Prudential, and Panasonic to hire 2,000 local residents by next year. We need to make sure they train and work with Newark residents. We need to make sure they help us in the schools to get kids prepared. The promise of better days is helping to erode the stigma associated with Newark's past. The 1969 uprising exposed police brutality and job inequality and also drove thousands of residents out, draining the city of its once mighty tax base and political accountability. Those days are gone, but as some degree of prosperity returns, Baraka sure hopes to ensure his city's uh, comeback won't leave those who've always lived here behind. The economy grows in the city. It's our job as uh, leaders and electeds here in the town to make sure that that wealth that comes in the community is redistributed in such a way that the majority of the residents can see some benefit from it. Would you ever have thought this was your future, Newark, New Jersey? No, nope. I thought that I was gonna move to California and do something cool out there. Ayana Post is one example. She found a job at Audible one year ago after struggling through a tough adolescence. I was living in a homeless shelter here in Newark called Covenant House. Yes. And they have a program here at Audible called Hire Local. She will enroll in college next year thanks to another Audible program that pays for the majority of tuition for all employees. It's changed her trajectory, all because the people who create cutting edge audio have also learned to listen to the needs of those around them. They help me shape my future now by investing their training, their hiring for their programs, everything they've done has helped me achieve what I am today. We basically said as long as you're bright and gregarious, we'll take it from there. Have you been able to filter up that talent pool? I mean, the higher ranks of the company uh, are representative. I'm more interested in the organic impact you're creating jobs at all levels for all kinds of people.
this cathedral is filled with people who have come from all over the world. They're at the top of their game in technology. This is Audible. And as Audible continues to change the way we enjoy books, it's helped open up a brand new chapter for the city of Newark. Look, everyone in America loves a comeback story. Hmm. It's one of our great kind of, you know, storytelling kind of tropes. And being part of it, it actually has a, lot, a real lot of meaning and uplifting character. And, um, and you know, I, I would say the fact that so many people want to work here is justification enough to continue to try to help the city. After the break, we take you to a hospital in Haiti that's become a leading beacon for hope. We'll be right back. The devastating earthquake that struck Haiti in 2010 killed an estimated 250,000 people. It became the deadliest natural disaster in the history of the Western Hemisphere. Billions of dollars poured in to help. Despite that, little has changed. But as we discovered on our visit back to Haiti earlier this year, there is one bright spot that could provide a path for the future. Our trip began in the capital, Port-au-Prince, in the wake of Haiti's worst year since the earthquake. Mass protests, gang violence, rampant political corruption. Jobs are scarce, but perhaps most tragically, basic medical care can be almost impossible to find. So this is the general hospital in Port-au-Prince, or at least it should be the hospital. After the earthquake decimated the old hospital, a new one was planned immediately after. More than 80 million has been spent on it. It sits empty today. In the meantime, the old general hospital, what should be the main source of care for Haiti's biggest city, reeks of raw sewage. Piles of trash are everywhere. Agnès Anvier and her four-month-old son have been here for eight days. I'm sorry, buddy. I'm sorry. Right now, right now he's crying because he, he, he got to use the bathroom. He has to go and he can't. Yeah, he can't go to the bathroom. I'm sorry. I can't imagine the pain that he's in right now. Many patients don't get treated because they're often required to provide the medical supplies. Something as simple as surgical gloves that the hospital can't afford. But take a trip outside the capital and you find a remarkable place that many doubted could ever exist in this country. This is St. Boniface Hospital in Fond du Blanc, up the mountains on Haiti's southern peninsula. It was started in 1983 and in the last 10 years has become a leading beacon for Haitian hope. People come from hours away to this hospital, and it could be anything. The emergency room, maternity, anything. Connor Shapiro is the president of Health Equity International, which oversees St. Boniface. He first came here in 2003, and his wife is Haitian. On the day the earthquake struck, he was at work. Massive shaking, all the patients came running out of the hospital, all the, all, all the staff, everyone was running into the yard. We didn't know what had happened. Uh, uh, my wife, who was pregnant with our now nine-year-old, uh, was in Port-au-Prince at the time, and I didn't know what was going on. I can only imagine what that was like. Uh, I was uh, very fortunate. Uh, my wife uh, and uh, our daughter, they survived, um, and uh, many people were not as fortunate. It was a horrible situation. Instead of falling apart, Boniface has only grown. They now get 500 patients a day and went from an annual operating budget of $250,000 when Shapiro took over to $8 million today. People risk their lives to get here because they have no other choice. This is the entrance road to the hospital. It is full of ruts. It is mountainous, passable only by dirt bikes like this and 4x4 vehicles. These bikes effectively act as ambulances for people who need care. The drive up that treacherous road takes the better part of an hour. That's in addition to the three or four hours it can take just to get to the entrance. This woman is nine months pregnant and could deliver at any moment. I can get him, get him, get him, get him. Okay. We have patients coming all day. It's a constant flow of patients. For more than two million people on the southern peninsula, this is the only place to get an emergency C-section. The only place with a neonatal intensive care unit. We have uh, 35 babies here. Over 95% of these babies were born here at the hospital in the maternity center. If this unit weren't here, what would happen to these kids? 
uh, it, it's very difficult to talk about. But if this unit wasn't here, uh, these babies would all die. And what percent of them who are here survive? Uh, right now, we've been able to make it so that 85% of the babies here survive. St. Boniface has become one of the primary teaching hospitals in all of Haiti. It houses the Spinal Cord Trauma Center that treated many of the people injured in the earthquake. I think what's great is we're not treating most of those spinal cord injured patients who came from the earthquake. And the reason is they're back home living their lives. They've learned how to become productive members of society despite their handicap. We've been able to reach our goal of reintegrating them and allowing them to go back to being full productive members of society. That could not be more true for Maxoni Persona. Every morning he wheels himself up the hill to work at St. Boniface, helping people just as they helped him. Persona was trapped under rubble for three days after the earthquake. When he was pulled out, he was told he would never walk again. Where would you be if it weren't for this place? I don't know, maybe I'd be in the street, maybe I'd find some place to live. I don't know where I'd be. Very likely might not be alive. We yes, exactly. St. Boniface does not turn any patients away. They also receive no money from the Haitian government. They survive in a mix of private donations and outside grants. Dr. Inobert Pierre is in charge of running the hospital on a daily basis. He's been at St. Boniface for 18 years. I think we inspire people, and that's why also teaching has been more and more part of what we do here because we want to inspire a new model in uh, the Haitian healthcare system. And with not tons of finances, there are ways to improve healthcare system with some commitment, accountability, and uh, hard work. We asked Connor Shapiro why Boniface has succeeded when so many others have failed. There's no magic potion here. It's just been this slow, successful build that, that has been given time. Yes, absolutely. The community here has been the leader of this project from the beginning. They're the ones now working here at the hospital. Really, it's about investing in the Haitian people, in the physicians, the health practitioners, the nurses, lab techs who are here already, and we need to invest in them to be able to provide that care. There are lots of excuses for why things can go wrong in Haiti. We just don't accept any of them because we know that this is the right thing to do. You can find more stories like this every week on CBS This Morning Saturday. And join us for live news coverage 24-7 right here on CBSN, available for free across all platforms. Thanks for watching.